Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar uh, in the second in our All About Soils webinar series brought to you by North Coast Local Land Services. My name's Kel Langfield, Senior Land Services Officer for North Coast Local Land Services and I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional custodians of all the nations on which we live, work and play. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. As I mentioned, this is the second in a series of four webinars and today's focus will be on soil health. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, you can see the public chat there that everyone can type a question into if you would like. Uh, that's where David and I will see them and we can, or I can try and collate those if there's common questions for the end. Uh, if they're quick and easy ones to answer, David will do that as we go along. Um, without further ado, I will, wait, I will um, introduce David now. Um, David's had 20 years experience in rural landscapes, farming and food systems. Uh, currently working for land and food, land soil, soil land and food, sorry, and delivering extension projects for them. Um, he has a wide range in career working in both management and technical roles. Um, and he enjoys empowering farmers with knowledge and skills that make a difference. So without further ado, David, I'll pass over to you, mate, and uh, start today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kel. You know, thanks for having us back, and thanks everyone for coming in for today's uh, second part of the All About Soils webinar series. I'm just waiting for our screen to come up, and we'll jump into it. Thanks guys. So I can see the screen from my end. Hopefully everyone else can see the presentation as it's coming up there now. Uh, please punch something into chat uh, if you can see it just to let us know we're on track. Um, as Kel mentioned, um, yep thanks Jacob. As Kel mentioned today's uh, mainly focusing on soil health. Uh, the first thing I'll probably say about soil health is it's a pretty big topic. We only have one hour so I am going to kind of scoot through it a little bit but hopefully we can jump in and explore the key components of it as we go. But if there's lots of questions, that's good in a way, but we'll try and answer as many as we can. But it is a big topic, so we probably need to explore soil health a bit more after today, but hopefully we've given you a good head start onto the topic. Um, so I guess today the really focus is uh, what is soil health and how to manage it. Uh, and I guess if you've seen the webinar one, I kind of use that term. 21st century understanding of our soils being a complex ecosystem if you like and so I guess our challenge as farmers and graziers or landholders is to manage our topsoil so that we keep it in what we can call equilibrium uh, and keep it in a stable state so that it functions really well for us and that's really the perspective I'm going to take today is maintaining that soil or helping that soil to maintain itself in a good equilibrium for plant growth basically. Um, and so here's a soil here that's in pretty good nick and we'll come back and maybe talk about it a bit later. Um, so yeah, the, what we'll specifically cover through here in the next, this next hour is what is soil health? Like let's break down that word, that term a bit and, and look at the specifics around what is soil health, um, why it's important to your farm business, uh, the soil health checklist. So um, we can use a soil health checklist to kind of work through our soil health. And then the three main steps to managing your soil health, which is basically assessing soil health, the, the aspects of soil health. And then if you've identified a soil constraint, managing those soil constraints, whether it be ripping or liming or changing grazing management. Uh, and then the final key aspect of managing your soil health well is to monitor your soil health through time, keep a track on it. So we're going to explore briefly those four aspects of soil health and managing it. Once again, as Kel mentioned, if you've got any burning questions, please punch them into chat. Uh, we'll, um, we'll endeavour to answer them today, um, um, either during the webinar or at the end. So let's jump in now and explore soil health. Obviously one part of soil health is the living parts to the soil, uh, like this earthworm here. Um, but of course soil health also includes the physical aspect of the soil, including something called ground cover, which is really important for functioning soils. So I'd like to sort of start off our what it, defining what soil health is here by looking at this um, broken down bit of equipment in the paddock. 
So I just want you to imagine that you're on the lookout for a second-hand farm vehicle, whether it be a ute or a truck for the farm. And basically, you've rocked up to my place because I've got something for sale that you might be interested in. And you've rocked up to have a look at this second-hand uh, vehicle or asset that you're looking at. Uh, and obviously, uh, if you're expecting something that was in good nick and had wheels on it, then you're going to be disappointed at this point. But basically, when you're looking for a vehicle to buy a second-hand vehicle or you're looking at second-hand machinery, etc., then usually what we do is we have a kind of mental checklist and we say to ourselves, okay, is this vehicle in working order? Is it in good condition? And the way we do that is we might look at body condition, number of wheels on the vehicle, does other tyres worn or have they got some tread in them? It does the gear, is, the, is there a gearbox for a start and is it working properly? Are there oil leaks, black smoke, etc.? So whenever we're sort of, I guess, buying a second-hand vehicle, we've got a mental checklist on assessing the condition of the asset. We might do the same thing if we're looking at the fencing on a property. Um, we might be looking at buying property or leasing a property and you'll walk around and have a look at the condition of the fencing. What is it in poor condition, okay condition or really good condition? So that's their examples of where we're assessing the condition of the asset, if you like. And no matter what type of vehicle it is, we want to know before you give me your money and I sell you this, this truck, you want to know that it's in working order unless you're into vehicle restoration and you've got plenty of time. Uh, so obviously the reason we want that vehicle to be in working order is that the, a ute or a farm truck needs to carry out key functions for us. So there's no point buying a truck for the farm if it can't carry loads of hay, for example. You're wasting your money. So really, you know, a ute might carry loads, get you to town and back, carry passengers, tow vehicle, tow trailers, etc. There's a whole lot of, you know, uses that you need that vehicle to do for you. And really importantly, it needs to be able to do those things reliably not just in the easy times, but when the going gets tough. So hence a lot of people choose Toyota um, because it has that reputation of reliability and it can get the job done for you in tough conditions. But basically any soil asset, any asset on the business, including your soil, needs to be able to work for you in the difficult times and the easy times. And so your soil is also an asset in the business, just like the vehicles or the fencing or the machinery or the sheds. Uh, or the people for that matter, and uh, it's one of your most important capital assets in the business. And it's part of what we call your natural capital um, in the business. And basically, we need to keep that soil in good condition. You know, for us to maximise pasture growth here, it's not just about the fertilisers and fertility. It's also about water infiltration, nutrient cycling, uh, healthy perennial grasses that have big root systems, and they're all can fall under the gamut of soil health. So if you're going to be productive in the long term, then we definitely need to keep our soil asset in good condition. And that's, this is really what we mean by soil health. Uh, it's just another way of saying your soil's in good condition. Uh, is it working well? Or sometimes they're stuffed uh, and you've got to fix them up. Uh, and no, there's no point putting fuel in the tank when it's stuffed because it won't fix the problem. If I'm miss, miss, missing wheels on the vehicle, putting fuel in the tank is not going to fix the problem. So uh, I guess in a nutshell, soil health, if we get a little bit more specific, soil health is really a soil that has good structure, a soil that has a balanced biological community, a soil that has a balanced soil chemistry. So the key aspects of soil chemistry, and by that I mean things like pH and salinity, etc., are in reasonable equilibrium. Uh, and we have enough organic matter which is a really important aspect of soils because it drives all the processes in soils. So most of the processes in soils are driven by uh, life combining with organic matter uh, and then combining that with minerals. So I need enough organic matter. That's really critical. So that's really in a nutshell, if you like, um, the four parts to soil health or the components of a soil's health. Um, and I guess then the question is, well, why, why do we bother about soil health? Um, why is it so important? And the reason is in the same way that that vehicle does key jobs for you, gets you to town, tows a trailer, carries a load reliably, a soil carries out really important functions for us as, as farmers and graziers. And those functions there I'll just go through briefly. But this topsoil here, you know, it's growing crops uh, and it needs to be doing that job well um, to optimise that crop, crop growth. So the first really important function that your soil asset does for you is it captures and stores water. 
uh, when rain falls it either goes in the ground or across the ground as runoff or a surface flow and the best place for most of it to go most of the time of course is into the soil because then plants can get it. So a healthy soil has really good structure and porosity with air spaces between the, the aggregates of your soil and that really optimises the water cycle. So you get more of your rain going into the soil and more of the water, the soil moisture being held in plant available forms. So that's one of the reasons, a very big reason why soil health is so important. Second one is that soils that are healthy cycle their nutrients more efficiently. So almost all your nutrients on the planet are held in the soil minerals, except for nitrogen, which is a gaseous element. Um, but where your and so when your soil health is really good and your biological function is high and the root volume is high in the soil, then that soil system is is making available and cycling nutrients in a really efficient way. It's really optimising that nutrient cycling. Uh, and so the term we use is uh, the soil has good nutrient cycling capacity. And that's a whole of system process. It's driven by roots, plants, minerals uh, and the organic matter, air and water, all combining with the soil life uh, in a kind of equilibrium. Another couple of reasons that soil health is so important and why we should bother about it is basically, well, when I have a soil in equilibrium with good air and water and porosity, and balanced chemistry, uh, then it provides an optimum environment for plants to grow. And in particular, it allows plants to, opt to express their root system to their full genetic potential. And that's really important because when a plant has a fully developed and uh, well, well balanced root system, it can optimise its own uptake of nutrients. So plants are not passive in their uptake of nutrients, they're very proactive. And so if we op allow them to optimise their root system by providing them a good balanced environment in the soil, then they will um, definitely photosynthesise more and take up uh, a good balance of nutrition for themselves. Uh, and then a final really important reason that soil health is, is important is that it can help minimise soil borne diseases. So in a healthy soil we've got a balanced biological community and there's lot, there are pathogens in your soil and pests that chew plant roots and, and cause yield decline, nematodes, cane, uh, cane grubs in cane, nematodes, uh, cock chafers or pasture grubs, all of which can really lower yield potential and it's pretty clear that when I have a good diverse biological community in my soil I can minimise the impact of those pests and diseases. I might not eliminate them, but I can do what we call I can improve what we call disease suppression in the soil, and that all boils down to diversity of biology in the main. So this is another really important reason. And finally, uh, when you have a healthy topsoil, it actually helps the wider landscape. You've got lower temperatures at the surface, so less evaporation, less dust, less erosion, uh, improved biodiversity. If there's more soil insects, then there'll be more bird life around. All of those things get benefited by the healthy soils in the landscape. Um, and so no matter what type of soil you have, whether it be coastal floodplains on the north coast or the hinterland, you know, hills of the hinterland or even up, up around the Liston area on the higher country, it doesn't really matter whether you're on granite or sediments or floodplain soils or basalt soils. Uh, the main thing is they need to be kept in good condition. Uh, from, for almost all agricultural enterprises, unless you're growing lichens or something that just needs bare rock and can tolerate concrete, um, you need to have structure and aeration and soil function. So yeah, it doesn't matter what soil type you're on, you need to keep your soil in good condition or keep it healthy. Um, and so what I guess in summary what we're saying is for a soil to be healthy, the key components of it need to be adequate and balanced. Um, and I don't mean by that the nutrition, the fertility, that's a separate question that's really important but it is a separate question. But we're trying to help the soil to maintain its equilibrium and here's an example for you of a trial site where the guys are using some aeration equipment to try and improve structure because the soil is a bit compacted. Uh, the same soil type, the same rainfall, the same fertility in the soil. Um, both under the same treatment except for the aeration and just, just improving the aeration has allowed the plant roots to grow deeper and, and, and have a bigger volume of roots which has improved the production of that area. So we're really trying to optimise that soil environment for plants to grow. Um, so I guess coming back to our asset, in the same way that we had a checklist for our uh, our, our second hand vehicle or a checklist on a property, we might be inspecting a property, 
in the same way that we can have a soil health checklist to kind of inspect the condition of our topsoil uh, and that's what I call the soil health checklist. So the soil health che checklist actually is only about 10 to 12 things. Uh, there might be a couple more depending where you are. But really, you know, it's, it's about 10 to 15 things, let's say, that I can check to see whether I've got kind of a soil in reasonable equilibrium and condition for plants to grow. And so part of that checklist, here's a part of it here, you can see the guys up here at Glen Innes on the New England running through a soil health checklist and, and assessing a soil. Uh, part, some of those things on the checklist, you need a soil test to use them um, and they include organic matter, carbon to nitrogen ratio, um, soil pH, soil salinity and then what we call the exchangeable cation balances. So that's the calcium, magnesium, potassium, aluminium, hydrogen and sodium cations and, and what proportions they are on a soil. So those things you really need a soil test to sort of look at them, inspect those things. But there's plenty of things that you, you need to get out in the field and have a look at. And that, that includes ground cover and litter on the soil, soil structure, surface condition, root activity, you know, and soil biology. So those things you can assess in the paddock. There are soil biology tests too that you can look at which may help you with assessing sort of biological health too. But yeah, so the key thing here is that there's a soil health checklist and if you follow that checklist, it sort of does help you make sense of soil health management and kind of narrows things down. Um, so the two main tools or approaches you need to, to use to, to manage your soil health well is using a soil test like these guys here are doing and field assessment, getting out with a spade and some simple equipment. And when you, you, when you take both those approaches, you'll get a good holistic understanding of your soil's health and condition. So I guess in a nutshell, there's that three-step process. We've looked at um, you know, what is soil health and why it's important. Uh, and then the fact that there's a bit of a soil health checklist to use when you're working through your soil health assessment. But then basically, no matter which aspect of your soil health you're looking at, there's kind of like a three-step process to it. And the first step is to assess the soil health for that indicator. So that's where you measure the soil health using an indicator, whether it be carbon levels in my soil or soil structure or pH. I measure the indicator and I have to assess that against a benchmark. So I'm going to assess my pH, for example, against what target I have or what, what I think is a good pH for my crop and my soil type. And then the third, the third thing that will happen in that assessing soil health step is if I'm outside my target, then, I can, uh, then I've identified a soil constraint. So if my pH is 4 and my target is 5.5, then I'm clearly outside my target and I'm probably losing yield because my soil's not functioning well. And so at that point, I have what we call a soil constraint. So that's really the first stage of managing your soil health is what we call assessing the soil health, the indicators of soil health off your checklist. Uh, the second step, if you like, in good soil health management is to then manage any constraints that you've identified. So if you've identified that poor structure is a soil constraint in your paddock, then you've got to decide, well, what do I do about it? Um, do I get a ripper and, and rip open the soil to get some air and water in? Or do I change my grazing management? Or do I just get dynamite and blow the whole topsoil up because it's that compacted? So no, I'm just kidding, don't use dynamite. So you can see here that basically once you've identified a soil constraint, you have to decide what's the right tool to use or approach to use that's going to be economic and get me real improvement in my soil function. And they usually fall into either different practices or adding soil inputs, which we sometimes call soil amendments. Uh, and so that final step of good soil health management is monitoring. So once you've identified a soil constraint and let's say you've changed your grazing management to try and improve soil structure or organic matter levels uh, and get more water into your soil, for example, then you might keep an eye on that improvement. After a year or two, you might measure, all right, are we getting a better soil structure developed here? Or are we getting deeper root systems uh, developing in this topsoil? So that means you've got to do some monitoring. Uh, so regularly, whether it's once a year, once every three years, you have to come up with a bit of monitoring plan to see that you're keeping your soil on track. Um, so what I'll do now, what I thought I'd do in this next sort of session is jump into a few examples 
um, and we'll have a look at a couple of examples of how I can follow that process on just a few aspects of soil health. Um, but if there's any questions, please feel free, free to throw them into the chat bar, but otherwise, yeah, save them up for the end if they're there. But if any, any pop up, please do pull us up and we'll, we'll try and talk about them. So let's pick on uh, one aspect of soil health, um, one of the things off the soil health checklist, and that's soil organic matter and how we can manage it in terms of our soil health. Now we could have, I could have picked on soil carbon and often people will talk about soil carbon or soil organic matter, but I'm just going to pick on soil organic matter to today. But the key thing to sort of make note is that carbon is a part of your organic matter. So when you're measuring soil carbon, it's kind of part of your organic matter. So people measure one or the other sometimes. Um, so just very briefly, why is organic matter important? Why is it a part of the soil health checklist? Uh, and the reason is that it's really important because it's the food source for a lot of the soil community. It drives the nutrient cycling in your soil. It helps build soil structure and the development of humus. It's pretty much it's pretty much the heart of a functioning soil system. No matter what soil type you're on, whether you're on a, a low fertility soil granite or a higher fertility volcanic type soil with lots of nutrients in it, if I don't have soil organic matter providing that energy and um, sort of lo uh, giving the life in the soil, that energy and food source, then I won't get the development of a well-structured, high-functioning soil. So whatever soil type you're on really needs some organic matter in it. And this is an example for you of, of a, a, a perennial crop uh, on the right-hand side where it's mulched heavily and less than a metre away in the interrow. You can see the mowing where they mow the grass in between the interrows of the perennial crop. In this case, it's vanilla. You can see that the organic matter is very different, even though it's the same soil type. But one's getting a lot of mulch applied, and one isn't. Um, so let's look at assessing soil organic matter, um, and we could use carbon interchangeably, but I'll just stick on organic matter. Um, so it can be measured using a soil test. So pretty much, it's hard to measure soil organic matter objectively with a spade in the paddock. You can kind of visually look at a soil like that dark soil we just saw before. But we don't actually know our numbers, our amount of organic matter visually. We have to use a soil test. It's measured as a percentage of the soil. Uh, and on the north coast, you can get soil organic matter levels from less than 1% or around 1, 1.5% up to over 10%. And it really depends a lot on the management and the disturbance of a soil as to what levels you get. Um, soil type or texture does influence it and rainfall as well, but uh, human management and vegetation is, is a big part of the organic matter that's on a paddock. So um, when you've measured your soil, uh, or soil organic matter from a soil test, obviously then you need to work out is it good or bad. Let's say for example you've got 3% and you're on grazing country on the coast, you have to say to yourself, well is that a good amount or do I need more or what, what's a good target or benchmark. So that's where you have to find a benchmark and say to yourself, all right, I've got 2% or 3% or 5% um, in grazing, for example, or if I'm on sugarcane, for example, on the north coast, it might be at 1%. Uh, and I've got to ask myself, you know, what's a good target to have? Because I do need a minimum amount of organic matter in my soil. So I've just thrown some general targets there to you. Now, they are general and they're just rules of thumb, but they'll at least give us a bit of a guide for this session. And I'm, I'm just going to propose to you that if you're in the grazing permanent pastures, the north coast of New South Wales, and you know you really need to be trying to hit 5% organic matter in your soil. Uh, if you're cropping, then you know trying to get it to 3% is a good aim, uh, and that includes sugarcane, which I know it's very problematic to get organic matter up. And tree crops the same. I'm suggesting that if you've got macadamias or uh, other tree crops, that aiming for about 5% would be a reasonable minimum target. Um, and so that's some targets, just as a general thing. So I guess our next target, we've measured it, we've got a target, and then we can compare our results against the target. So if we're at or above our target, then we can give ourselves a smiley stamp. So at that point, it's probable that we have enough organic matter to keep our soil functioning, to keep it in high you know, equilibrium and functioning well. So we give ourselves a smiley stamp. We don't have a soil constraint. Uh, and I don't need to spend money, although I do need to keep doing what I'm doing to maintain that organic matter. If you're just below your target, let's say your target is 4% or 5% and you're at 3.5%, you might say you're marginal 
Um, so you may put a kind of neutral face or, or a negative or a neutral kind of sign because you may have a, soil, a minor soil constraint. So remembering a soil constraint is anything that is limiting the development of plant roots and functioning of the soil systems. So it's not talking about fertility levels. So I can have a low fertility soil that actually has really good structure, really good roots and is kind of maximising the little bit of fertility that's there. So in this case, you know, we're, we're looking, we're seeing oh, if it's marginal, I might, the organic matter might be kind of limiting the performance of this soil to some extent. And if you're well below your target, let's say you're at 1% and your target's 3%, well, it's pretty poor and you're scoring a, a sad face against that assessment and you probably at this point have a soil constraint. So it's most likely that your um, soil health, your organic matter aspect of your soil health is limiting yield potential in the long term. And that could be because it's limiting uh, the efficient cycling of nutrients because organic matter is critical for that. But it also could mean that you're just not holding as much water as you potentially could for your climate because you don't have water holding capacity and infiltration rate capacity which organic matter helps a lot with. So you can see here, you've got a number, you've benchmarked your number and now you're assessing it and hopefully you're getting as many smiley faces as possible. Uh, so uh, Stephen's just put a quick one in there, uh, the southern tablelands. So Stephen, I'm assuming down, so you are outside the LLS zone, north coast, but I'm happy to go there. Look, it's pretty similar, temperate, temperate grazing systems, um, you know, 5% is probably a minimum through the tablelands of New South Wales and northeast Victoria. Uh, and um, uh, it does depend a bit on soil type. So the granite soils obviously can develop less organic matter than the, the, the volcanic soils that are high in fertility. But yeah, you still see 5% uh, is, is probably a minimum uh, target to aim for. Um, so question to ask, answer yourself. Hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel, Stephen. Um, so yeah, so I guess if you've got a smiley face, then the question you've got to ask yourself, what can I do to maintain this level? Um, marginal, then you have a minor store constraint. What can you do to improve this level? And sometimes the marginal results are the ones that are a bit tricky to know whether it's going to be economic or how much economic improvement I'm going to get. If you have a major soil constraint, so obviously your organic matter is really low, then it's probable that when you fix it, you'll get a much better improvement to yield or carrying capacity or water infiltration, all those really beneficial things agronomically. And so you've got to now ask yourself, well, what do I do to fix it? And that leads us to the last part of, um, of the steps in managing organic matter. Uh, and that is, what are the, what are the different uh, tools I can do? I can add things like compost being spread here. Does that help me or is that really going to give me bang for buck? And it may or may not, depending on the situation. Uh, or is grazing management a tool to use? And I'd suggest to you that in the North Coast, it's probably your biggest tool on grazing landscapes. Uh, is to get to optimise your grazing, uh, which there's been there's plenty of resources out there on that. The LLS have from from their previous work and and Dr. Judy Earle's fact sheets that the North Coast have published. Uh, and so yes, so though you've got to be thinking through, well, what are the if I've got a major soil constraint, what are the things I can do to improve things? Uh, and because it's an economic investment that I'm making to improve my asset, my soil asset. So hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for those first three steps of assessing your soil, in, the, in this case your soil organic matter, and then benchmarking it and then going, all right, do I have a soil constraint, yes or no? And then going, all right, I've got to take action to fix it. And then finally, I want to keep an eye on it. So if I've set my target for organic matter of 4% or 5% or 7% or whatever it is that you've decided on, and I'm reaching my target, how do I keep monitoring it to make sure that I'm keeping that soil in at my target and in good condition. So when it's about monitoring organic matter, obviously what tool, tool will, you, will you use? Well, it's obviously a soil test. Um, but then you have to think about, well, what depth do I sample my soil to to measure and monitor organic matter and organic carbon? Uh, how will you sample? Will you just do a kind of spot sample at a site? Or do you do a transect? Uh, and how often you'll do that? Should I measure it every year or every three years? Or what's the realistic? time frame under which I'm going to get some improvement in my soil. So these are the sort of questions that you now need to ask yourself if organic matter is an issue for you and you think you need to monitor it, which in most soils it is important, pretty much every topsoil on the planet. Uh, um, it's not always easy to fix, but it's definitely um, a key parameter of soil health in North Coast soils. 
Um, and so we'll I'll probably just pick on two more because of our time limitation, but hopefully it'll just give you a feel for this process that we're following. So let's now jump to another one which is a bit of an issue around the north coast at times and that is soil acidity, or um, not so much alkalinity on the coast, but soil pH. So obviously soil pH measures the acidity or the alkalinity in the soil. Um, it influences soil function, so when a soil is acid, which can happen on the coast, as you guys would know, uh, when I have soil acidity, it can influence the cycling and uptake of nutrients to plants. It can also influence the biological community. You can actually change the biological community and it's got a kind of processes um, as the soil gets very acidic. Sometimes aluminium becomes a problem in those situations as well. Uh, and so it ha soil acidity and alkalinity does influence a wide range of things in the soil. Again, taking that more sort of 21st century view of soil being a complex system or what we call a self-organising system, um, pH does influence the soil community and plants, but it does also happen the other way. So plants and the soil community and the organic matter and how that's all processed by the, the system does also modify the pH. So it's not just a one-way thing, pH, like everything's influenced by pH. pH is also influenced by the living aspect of the soil as well in combination with the soil minerals. So it's a bit of a two-way thing and, and I guess our goal is to get an equilibrium. So pH can be measured using a soil test or in the field. So we can use a soil test or as you can see me here um, doing a bit of a test there at Ebor with the little pH kit which most of you would have seen. It's measured as a 0 to 14 scale with 7 being neutral. So 7 is kind of in the middle, the textbook neutral, and below 7 is acidic and above 7 is alkaline. And a lot of the north coast soils can get acidic, a lot of the tableland soils can get acidic uh, as well. And so it's obviously thinking through, well, what's a target to set? So uh, the north coast soils are often acidic due to rainfall, the soil mineral composition, as well as management practices. So things like um, uh, high use of nitrogen fertilizer over time will, will um, drive acidity or, or excess legumes in a paddock. They, they can also influence it. So when you've got your result from your assessment, so if you're measuring pH, you need to work out if it's good or bad, just as we did for organic matter. You know, I've got a pH of 5, well is that what I want or is it too low or is it too high? And so you need to compare it against a, a target or a benchmark. Uh, and again, I'm just giving some very general targets, um, but there's plenty of information for the North Coast um, through the LLS uh, and some of the local agronomists have. Um, you'll find plenty of good info about pH targets for different areas, for different enterprises. But if we just stick with some general ones, and this is measured in what we call calcium chloride, uh, which is one way to measure pH. There's a few ways it's measured. If we just say above 5 for, for grazing, above 5.5 to 6 for cropping, and the same for tree crops. It does depend a little bit on what you're growing. Obviously, some tree crops are more tolerant uh, than others, etc. But just for today's example, there's some general targets. So um, if my tar if I'm outside my target, then obviously uh, I need to do something. So if I'm above or at my target, it's all good. I give myself a smiley face. pH is probably not influencing soil function. That soil equilibrium, it's probably okay. If I'm around my target, if my target's 5.5 and, and I'm like 5.4, then you could say, well, it's marginal. You might have a minor soil constraint. But is it the main issue with me at the moment? It might be an issue, but it might not be the main issue influencing soil function. So at that point, you, you're not sure whether it's going to be economic to sort of fix it. Um, it may give you an economic return, or there might be other aspects of your soil that are more important, like it might be really compacted or there might be a lot of bare ground, in which case maybe they're more of a priority. So you've got to kind of look at different soil constraints together to come up with a conclusion. But if you're well below your target, so if your pH target's 6 and you're at 4.5 and, and your crops are probably suffering and that soil system is probably really not functioning well, then basically you've got to give yourself a grumpy face and uh, do something about it, basically. Um, so. Again, that same question, if it's good, what can I do to maintain my level? Um, if it's marginal, okay, can I improve it? Um, what can I do to improve it in an economic way? Um, or do I keep monitoring it and just check whether that is really an issue for me? It may not be an issue for me. pH is a really good one in pastures because 
Often people will go, yeah, well I limed, but I didn't limed, but I didn't see much of a response to the lime. Um, and other people will lime and get a really good response to the lime. So you go, well, what's going on there? And so often with with acidity in North Coast pastures, it's not necessarily the grasses that are that are that are suffering under the lower pH, but the legumes are much more sensitive to it. So you kind of know when your acidity in that soil is kind of limiting yield potential. Uh, one good way to sort of double check that is to look at the legumes. Are they growing well? Are they nodulating? Because they're more sensitive to acid, acid and aluminium. So the grasses can often be tolerant of it, but it's those those higher value um, herbs and grasses and forbs that you also want in your pasture that might be more sensitive. So you kind of, you, you're marginal for them and they're really important. So that's when you make your liming decision. Hopefully that makes sense to everyone. Um, so yeah, and again the same question though, if I've got an issue, if I have a major soil constraint or a minor soil constraint, is there a soil amendment that can help me? So obviously with, um, lime, uh, with pH it's often lime, if I'm acid, if I'm alkaline people sometimes put sulphur on, it's not commonly done but it it's, is done and it's what lowers the pH, uh, not that you guys on the coastal soils often want a lower pH. Um, and then there might be other things you could do as well, but soil amendment, lime and, and dolomite are the two main ones. But are there management practices that can help you get some equilibrium around your pH? So building humus in the soil, that long-term organic matter is a really good thing because it buffers soil chemistry, um, but also minimising soluble nitrogen fertilisers because and excessive legumes in a paddock because the excess nitrogen generated by those two practices can really drive uh, acidification in the soil as well. Uh, and if you're in a high rainfall area that um, that rainfall is also driving acidification, well you've just got to put a big umbrella on the paddock and stop all that rain working on your soil minerals. No, I'm just kidding. That's I can sell you umbrellas but it won't be economic. Uh, Julie's got a question in there. Yeah, Julie, uh, gypsum doesn't influence pH. So gypsum has calcium in it and so does lime. Uh, and both of those two things, without going into it too much today, but having enough exchangeable calcium in my soil colloid is really important and helps with soil function and soil health for sure. But the other side to this coin is the acid cations of hydrogen and aluminium and gypsum doesn't help get rid of them. So it adds calcium but it doesn't at the same time kind of bump off the acid cations, uh, whereas lime and dolomite do. So you'd use gypsum. Uh, in a, for a different reason uh, for soil health, but not so much directly for pH change. Yeah, hopefully that helps you out. Um, so again, jumping to the finally the final aspect here in our steps to managing soil health. In this case, pH. Uh, we're looking at you know what are you going to monitor? How are you going to monitor pH? Are you going to just use a field kit like what the guys here are using? Um, or are you going to use a soil test? Which method? Calcium chloride or water or a handheld meter? There's even meters now that you push into the soil to measure things like that. Uh, how will you sample it? Again, will you do a transect? Are you going to do, do one, one side on the property or a few different soil types? Uh, and how often, how regularly are you going to have to do it to, um, to keep an eye on that pH if it's a problem for you in your soil? So same questions you're asking there. So I thought, yeah, it looks like we're we're on time. So what I'll just do is finish off with a final example of of assessing an aspect of soil health. And this time I'll do one that's more biologically sort of focused, and that is root activity. So uh, it's really important that a topsoil has plenty of root activity in it. And you know, from a 21st century view on soils, a soil that has poor root activity has a soil constraint because soil plant roots are part of your topsoil. So when I don't have many plant roots in my topsoil, then my topsoil's uh, limited. So really, good root activity is a critical part of soil health, and poor root activity is a soil constraint. And the reason that roots are so important, you know, we now understand it's not just because plant roots take water and nutrients. It's not a one-way deal. Plant uh, plants are giving a whole lot of carbon-based compounds in the soil. They're stimulating a whole diverse range of microbes and soil organisms. So it's really a two-way relationship and you can see this paddock here um, where the soil development is really good and there's a really high volume of roots. It's actually a cane field uh, in central Queensland in Mackay but you can see the guys have really built up really good root volume which can be a real problem in cane soils. Um, so there's a two-way relationship. 
uh, and um, that's why you know we need to have a good volume of roots in there. It's critical for soil function and the formation of a, of a topsoil in equilibrium. So you can measure root activity in the field. It's quite hard to do in the laboratory. In high level R and D, they kind of take soil cores and go and measure them all. But really, you, there's some simple ways you can do it, and I won't go into it too much today because of time. But you can dig a cube of soil out, flip it over, and just do some basic field observations of root depth, root volume, or root health to assess your root activity. If we just pick on root depth, we can just do a 20 centimetre cube in the soil and just see whether the roots are going to 20 centimetres. Uh, that's a very simple uh, field assessment. Dig a 20 centimetre cube, flip it over. Am I getting 20 roots to 20 centimetres, for example, would be one way to make it a bit more objective. Uh, the results can range in pastures, and I'm just going to pick on pastures for today um, as a simple one. But if you're in a grazing pasture, a lot of the time where there's compaction or there might be overgrazing or even undergrazing and you haven't quite got the grazing management right, you may get root development going only to 5, 10 centimetres. And I'd suggest to you that, um, that that's probably limiting your topsoil. Um, in, in, in North Coast pastures and Tablelands pastures indeed, you know, I think you're really aiming for that 20 to 30 centimetre. It does depend a little bit on soil site. So sometimes you might be on a very rocky, shallow soil type. That's fine. That's a bit different. But if you're not on a shallow soil type with, a, say, a rocky next level down, then really that 20 centimetres plus would be a root depth target in pastures. Um, I've just got a couple of quick questions. I'll jump in there because they're pretty short. So Rachel, uh, you said Bunnings or a probe as far as the pH test. So yeah, the probe, um, well, without naming any names, Rachel, but the 10 buck probe, I wouldn't even go near it. The pH kit, the sort of colour, the colour metric kit um, that is sold in nurseries, including Bunnings, uh, it's a really good kit just to give you a field assessment. And then if you think your pH is marginal, then you might get a soil test before you make a big decision around liming or whatever it is you're going to do. Um, but yeah. Uh, I wouldn't go too much on the really cheap probes. There are some more expensive probes, um, but just be careful of the cheap ones, I think. Uh, yep, and Julie's put in there, the cotton industry have a program called Soil Your Undies. Yes, correct. So, yep, so Julie, that's that. what that's measuring is actually the decomposing soil organisms. In particular, it's measuring the fungi that decompose the more complex carbon in your soil, what we call the saprophytic fungi. So that the undies test actually specifically measures a group, one group within your soil community, uh, the, mainly the saprophytic fungi. So it doesn't really measure bacteria because they don't really, as far as I'm aware, they don't really eat cellulose, which is a bit complex for them. But yes, that's an, another test you can do for microbial activity um, or testing sort of biological activity. The problem with the undies test is if people use dirty undies, someone else is using clean and you're not going to standardise the results. So you've always got to use new undies and also different undies have different amounts of latex and uh, what is the other thing in them that they put in them, lycra and stuff. So that's all going to interfere with your scientific trial. So I like to use calico strips uh, from the, I, I buy calico and create strips because that's 100% cellulose. So yeah, the undies are good, um, but yeah, if you want to do it a little bit objectively, then a calico strip uh, is a really good way to do it. Um, okay, I'll keep rolling on here, uh, just coming back to our grazing depth uh, or root depth. So, you know, if I've gone out and dug up a cube of soil out of my pasture and my roots are really only going, say, to 10 centimetres, then I'd suggest to you that that's a limiting factor for um, um, you've got a soil constraint in a North Coast pasture. Um, and so I've given you a bit of a benchmark just myself. But if you're at 10 centimetres, you've got to compare it against a benchmark. Um, and so there's a few general benchmarks that I'm using uh, just in the work we do. Um, you know, if you're not getting to 20 centimetres root depth, um, and I'm excluding rocky soils here that might have rocks near the surface. Uh, cropping the same, you know, if you're in sugarcane, you know, the depth is much deeper, but at least 20 centimetres. Uh, and then tree crops where you're trying to get a feeding zone, so you're trying to get a mulch layer that has feeding roots in it, the tree's feeder roots in it. Uh, we want at least a five centimetre depth of feeder roots. So we call that the humus layer 
or um, the H layer in a top forest topsoil, and that should be full of the feeder roots of the trees. So that's our target that we use in soil land food for assessing kind of root activity um, and whether it's a soil potential soil constraint. Um, and so I guess then you've you've assessed your root depth. You look at all your undie tests, if you want to do that, Julie, assess how quickly it's chewed, the bugs have chewed up the undies. Um, and you decide whether you're at your target. If you're above your target, well, that's great. You've got good root depth. It's probably not hindering soil function. And so you probably have reasonable uh, soil health from the root depth point of view. Um, if you're just around your target, well, that might be marginal. Can I increase it a little bit? And if you're well below your target, like if you're at a five centimetre root depth or even 10 centimetres, on a deep, deep soil, then you're probably below your target. And if those perennial grasses can get another 10 centimetres down, they're going to be accessing a lot more nutrients and water, as well as putting a lot more carbon into the soil. So you can see that potential. You can double your water and nutrient uptake by doubling that 10 to 20 centimetre increase in sort of topsoil rooting depth. And I'm not talking about the runner roots. I know you'll get perennial grass roots go quite a lot deeper than that and tree roots. I'm, more talking about the fine mass volume of feeder roots. Um, okay, so I guess the question is the same sort of thing as we've dealt with before. Um, what you know, what what do I do to maintain it? We'll keep doing what you're doing. But if you have a poor root activity, what is hindering it? And it's often something else like compaction, aluminium, or just um, heavy grazing that's compacting the soil. It might be another limiting factor. To, that you need to overcome to improve the root, and often it's air and water. So, so if I've got poor root growth, a lot of the time it's poor air and water because that's what's going to hinder roots to go in there. But it sometimes is aluminium or another chemical issue that might be holding things back. Um, so again, the question you're asking yourself is: Is there a soil amendment? Will compost help? Will grazing management help? Will getting a deep ripper in help? Will spiking or using an aerator help? You have to ask yourself: You know, what is the right tool for me to get that improvement? Uh, and or is there a management practice? Um, and I'd suggest to you that grazing management, control traffic is a really good one in cropping, uh, cream, crop cover crops, just anything to get root volume going is, is all helping. Um, so I guess the final thing is how are you going to keep an eye on your root activity? What are you going to do? Go out there once a year with a spade or how are you going to keep an eye on it? So those are the things to think through. So I guess in a nutshell, I've just picked on three things today out of the soil health checklist. I've picked on uh, soil organic matter or carbon. We could have used carbon, soil uh, pH and plant root depth. We've only picked on three out of the 10 or 11 things on the health checklist. But basically, you've got to go through all of your checklists if you really want to find out how well your soil's going. But just as importantly, identify potential soil constraints because that's really what soil health is all about identifying potential soil constraints that I can improve, I can help improve so the soil can really find its optimum equilibrium for, for my climate and soil type. And so it's all about assessing your soil health indicators against benchmarks, identifying soil constraints, and then implementing things to fix your problems, uh, and then finally monitoring it to keep an eye on things. So it's that same process we're following. Um, and so just some last points before I pull it up and open up for any questions. When you're assessing soil health, it's not a good idea just to jump on one indicator. So just because I've got good organic matter, I might have organic matter at 8%, so you'll see this. You'll have organic matter at 7 or 8% in a pasture, and yet the root depth is less than 10 centimetres. So just because the organic matter is really good on your soil test and you give yourself a happy smiley face and a pat on the back, but your root depth is less than 10 centimetres. So you've got to use all of your indicators in, in a holistic way to get a complete understanding if you really want to diagnose the problem. Because if I just went on the soil organic matter number on my soil test, I might say, oh, my soil health's really good. But if I get out with a spade and I can see a compaction layer at 10 centimetres, then actually that organic matter, it's good, but it's only good for 10 centimetres. In fact, my soil still has a major soil constraint. So you need to look at, don't look at numbers in isolation, uh, which I think I'll put here, because actually that can be dangerous. And it's like pH. You might say, oh, my pH is not very good. But if you go out in the paddock and you see good clover content, uh, your forbs and your herbs or your chicory and these other broad leaves are growing well, the clovers are nodulating well, well, then maybe the pH is OK. The soil system seems to be in equilibrium. So it's using holistically using field and soil test indicators. 
Uh, and then when benchmarking too, don't just blindly follow Dave Hardwick's dodgy benchmarks. No, I'm just kidding. They're not dodgy. Just yeah, look, make sure the benchmarks you're using are applicable to your region, um, and go and 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 or you're developing them by going to a paddock that's performing well on the same soil type, and just make sure you're using good benchmarks because that's as you can see the critical thing. What your target is will determine, you know, how you rate your soil and get some local knowledge and context where you can as well. Sometimes the local knowledge around soil health is not strong, so uh, sometimes you, you do have to look outside the field a bit. Uh, and, and as I said, it, soil tests only tell part of the story. You also need to look at the soil in the paddock. And this is an example where I was asked to go and con consult on a paddock in southern New South Wales for an investor, and the soil test numbers looked okay. And then I rocked up and saw this, and the structure was extremely problematic, floodplain soil, and yeah. It, when you scrape away those bold, those mini boulders, uh, it's like concrete. So yeah, that soil had okay numbers on the soil test, but in reality, it's got some major soil constraints. And unless they're willing to invest in fixing that, they're always going to have problems with the with the production. Uh, you can't get the complete story of soil health just off a soil test. So get out with a spade uh, and use that as well. So on that note, I'll kind of pull it together. I think, Kel, I think hopefully we've covered things off not too quickly. But yeah, well, we might open it up for a few questions. And thanks, everyone, for attending. Yeah, thanks, David. That was actually really good. Just some really simple uh, methodologies and ways to go about looking at all of the some of the factors that you, you know, people should look at when they're trying to assess their soils for their soil health. So yeah, we do have a few minutes left. If there's people that um, wanted to ask a question and throw it into the, the chat there, I can see there's one there from Jacob now um, about compaction from years of cattle cattle grazing. Yeah, yeah, I'll comment. tackle yeah. that one. Yeah, um, yeah. Comment that. So Jacob, yeah, so if you, if you do know you've got that compaction layer, Jacob, and, and, it, and it is probably more common than what people realise because we don't go out with a spade enough. Um, but yeah, so I guess where you start depends a little bit on your economic return. So if your country's got a lot of slope, it's pretty hilly. Um, you might a lot of your country might be sort of gentle slopes, or it might be steep slopes with a lot of floodplain and a lot of and not much sort of upper slopes. So in a way, you kind of look at the areas that are maybe going to give you your economic bang for buck. So if you're on gentle rolling country, for example, you might tackle your mid-slope areas um, because they're the ma they're the majority of hectares that you own. Um, whereas if you're in a, if you've got a property that's got a lot of lower lying country, well maybe and that's got moisture in it, maybe that's your economic place to start because because um, that'll give you more improved grazing country. So hopefully that makes sense, Jacob. But it's about looking at okay, well. Um, where's my priority areas um, based on you know if I fix this I'll get more bang for buck and the, and the really problematic areas like the top of hills that are naturally quite shallow soiled often anyway do I really focus on them first I certainly want to improve them but is that my high sort of high focus area high priority area initially it may not be but if you own a lot of ridges well then maybe it is really important that you focus on that first hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel Jacob well, hopefully I'll address that Uh, there's a question there from Gianna about bahia grass and fireweed as indicators of uh, bad soil condition, um, or is it some other factor, David? Yeah, so I guess Gianna, um, I guess the key thing with pastures is if you if you're grazing for the per, the preferred perennial grasses. So if your grazing tactics are not over grazing your preferred perennial grasses, then usually what happens over time is that they get more competitive. So obviously they're the ones that make your money because they're your high production pastures for animals. But if you graze them well, I give them time to recover after each grazing event and leave enough dry matter standing after you've grazed them, then what happens over time is that they'll get more competitive. And as they get more competitive, perennial grasses, they have a fibrous root system. So they will naturally open the soil up more. And so what you'll do is you'll change the soil conditions physically and, and biologically. Um, you'll get more air in there. So the perennial grasses become more competitive. So in many cases, I'm not saying in, for all weeds, but for many cases 
what happens in that situation is that the, the weedy species tend to become much less of a problem. So they become less dominant because you've actually changed the soil health in a way, particularly structure, aeration, uh, friability of the soil and, and the perennial grasses are driving that. So grazing them can minimise your weed burdens. But certainly some of the tussock grasses like love grass or um, the other tussock grasses that are weeds because they're low fertility grasses and they're quite low quality grasses from a forage point of view, they can be quite problematic because they're when you graze them the same way they might dominate. Um, but certainly fireweed, yeah, um, my experience working on a dairy on the mid north coast was when it started to come into the district was often on the soils that were probably overgrazed and were starting to get a bit tight. Um, yeah, so um, that's my observation on fireweed. Um, but yeah, hopefully that gives you a bit of a feel for it, Jana. I guess we focus on the rule of thumb is focusing on the plants you want and grazing to optimise them. And you'll find that the problematic species tend to become a minor issue in the pa in the pasture mix. Uh, Stephen's put in there deep ripping. Yeah, so Stephen, deep ripping. And even aerating soil does more harm to soil biology than good. Yeah, so I guess Stephen, it all depends on where the soil's at. If there's no oxygen and water getting into the soil, then any air and water will improve soil biology. So a deep rip when the soil is concrete actually will get air and water in. You're going to improve soil biology because it's already at ground zero in concrete. Um, whereas maybe if I'm doing that too much too often and the soil has already got reasonable structure then uh, yeah, maybe I am throwing the system out a little bit biologically um, or stimulating it too much is probably a more accurate term to use. Um, but yeah, there are times where you're getting no air. In, like the golden rule is to fix soils, the first thing is, is there air and water getting in because everything else is academic. If there's no air and water getting in, we can forget sowing seed, we can forget adding fertiliser, we can get, forget adding lime. We need air and water for life to start, whether it's a plant, root system or it's a bacteria or whatever. So yeah, in the cases where that's really tight, then yeah, maybe then definitely ripping and or aerating may help. But if I have to keep doing that, well, maybe I'm not addressing the underlying problem really of that change management can do. Uh, Neil, Neil's put in there a late apology to the webinar. Can you tell me your preferred organics to boost soil health quickly? No worries, Neil. I've got a product for sale. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's called Dynamite. It opens your soil up. Yeah, look, Neil. If you're in grazing, then the, the main, the number one tool you have is grazing management, grazing your perennial grass as well, and having some diversity in the pasture. Uh, number two tool is grazing and diversity, and number three tool is grazing and diversity. Uh, and then it's looking at if you have a chemical constraint like aluminium, uh, etc., or, or P, severe acidity. Um, but as far as putting, if you're in cropping, well then, you know, some of your options to increase organic matter might include adding compost or cover crops, getting large biomass of cover crops going. So it depends a little bit on your farm enterprise. But um, generally in pastures, grazing management's your number one, two and three tool, followed by, you know, addressing the major soil constraints. And if you're in cropping, it's really uh, getting that compaction, a minimum till and getting wheels off. Uh, and then, yeah, then some high biomass material. Um, but compost can certainly be a tool in that case and in tree crops as well. Uh, thanks, David. I've just thrown into the chat there. There was a question about this, the checklist. I, I do know that Soil Care on the website there, there's a link there um, that will take you to a range of publications um, which step you through some of those sort of things you can do yourself in the paddock. Uh, in terms of checking some of your soil health <coughs> outside of getting a, um, a soil test as well. So they're a useful little guide for people. Yep, um, the, soil health, the soil health card is really yeah, good. The soil health cards, really yeah. yep. Yep. There's a couple of yep. other schemes out there. The LLS did one up, the CMAs did one up in New South Wales. But yeah, just using one of those, the soil health cards are great first, first stepping point. We've probably got time for that one last question there about a view on dung beetles to improve soil biology, and then we'll probably then we'll have to wrap things up for today. Yeah, no worries. Well, I guess the view on dung beetles is that they're really important for soil function. Uh, not only are they good for biology by taking organic matter in the form of dung into the soil, um, a lot of the soil community moves 
nutrients and organic matter up and down and that's a really neglected area of thought when we come to managing our soil that vertical movement in the soil and that's what deepen, helps deepen topsoil um, and so dung beetles are a great one of them and the term we have for dung beetles is eco a soil engineer or an eco engineer because of that role they play in opening soils up getting air and water and nutrients down plant roots can follow those pores down so yeah really important uh, there's plenty of good info. I noticed the YouTube channel of the LLS has a dung beetle, um, some info there, and there's plenty of other info out there, really good info. But yeah, dung beetles, champions, you need them if you're in grazing. Absolutely. Thanks, David. Um, we'll probably, we'll, we'll bring it to an end there now. So I'd like to um, thank everybody who, thank David firstly for a wealth of information there on soil health to start things off. Uh, I think our next webinar will probably expand on, on, on that topic as we go forward. Um, you did, everyone would have seen in the chat there earlier on the link to our uh, YouTube channel where you'll find lots of interesting webinars and other short videos on a range of topics, which is a really good place to start, as well as our own website where we've got some soil resources, including the fact sheet that David referred to earlier, um, put together by Dr. Judy Earle. Um, and they're a useful resource for people as well, and they can be downloaded from our website. So on that note, I'll say thank you to everyone again. Thanks to David, and keep an eye out for the notification on website number three, uh, web webinar number three in the series. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Kill.